You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Beside the Brook, Chapter 8, A Christmas Party It was Christmas Eve, and Mother was putting the finishing touches to the Christmas tree. Peggy and John had been lucky enough to have one each year during the war, but this one was specially big and specially laden. Father had gone with one of the foresters from the timber yard to choose it from the plantation, before the stately rows of young firs were dug up to supply Covent Garden. Now the choice stood in a corner of the sitting-room in a tub draped with crinkly green paper. Father had twined a string of fairy lights in and out of the branches. Mother had fixed a gold star to the pointed top near the ceiling and tied pretty glass spangle things, already older than John, to the drooping branches. Holly paper, save from year to year, was fetched out to wrap the surprise parcels. The labels were all written, and the tree could hold no more, so that other parcels were beginning to pile up round the tub. The floor was in rather a mess with string, holly leaves, cotton wool and paper. The cake in the larder was demanding its ruffle to hide where the icing ended. The trust chicken yawned for its stuffing, and Mother was very tired. "'Have you got Teddy's presents on the tree, Mother?' called Mr. Broom. "'Yes,' came the reply. "'And we haven't forgotten one for Ginger. "'Teddy asked if he might bring his cat when I sent the invitation.' "'Poor old chap,' said Father. "'I'm glad he is coming. "'He'd have a lonely Christmas in that queer place otherwise.' "'Mother shuddered. "'Yes, just imagine how... Dim and cheerless it must be those long evenings, with those branches soaring up and down on a night like this, and the mournful sound of the brook always rushing by. But he doesn't mind, said Father. He's one of the happiest people I've met. Yes, and the children love him, said Mother, sprinkling sparkling snow over the fir branches. I'm glad they're growing thoughtful. It was their idea to ask him for Christmas Day, though I would have suggested it had they not done so. I think I'll make that do for tonight. It's almost Christmas Day now. I suppose the children haven't forgotten the stockings, said Father. No, indeed, and John declared he would stay awake to see who filled them, said Mother. But they've both been asleep since before nine o'clock. The postman was puzzled next morning as he handled a large envelope bearing the address, Teddy Tingtong, Mr. Wilmot's farm by the brook. The card inside, showing a family of robins disporting themselves among holly twigs, was John's own secret, and formed the only correspondence that the shepherd had received since his arrival at the Sheeling. "'Who's it for, anyway?' asked the postman at the dairy. "'Oh, that's what the broom children call the shepherd who lives in yon hut by the brook. "'Leave it here, and I'll see, as it,' said the dairyman. "'Now I'll take it myself,' said the postman. "'Along this way?' "'That's right, over the cart bridge and along the bank. "'You'll find him.' The postman did find Teddy chopping sticks and talking to Ginger, who was purring and snarling over the furry hind legs of the baby rabbit. "'You'll come to harm catching rabbits, Ginger. Do I no give you enough to eat that you must catch them?' he was saying. "'Good morning, sir. Something for you,' called the postman cheerily. "'Eh, something for me,' exclaimed the old man, his hand shaking with excitement. "'Only a card,' said the postman. Teddy smiled. "'And from a bairn,' he said. "'Poor laddie. "'It's from John, bless his heart. "'Happy Christmas, postman. 
It was good of you to rape so long here when you could have left it at the farm. Quite all right. I'm glad I found you, replied the postman, and a happy Christmas to you. But to himself he said, The poor old fellow is not likely to have much of a Christmas there. He himself was looking forward to a merry day with his rosy children around a big fire and meals fit for a king. However, the postman was mistaken, for Teddy's heart was full of the joy and peace that the angels had told those far-off shepherds about when the little Christ was born. He saw beyond the bare trees still dripping from last night's rain and the mud that plastered his heavy boots, for in his mind he beheld a picture of a bright earth lit by the presence of that same Christ returned in glory to dwell among men. Then there will be peace on earth, goodwill toward men, when he comes to take the throne of his father David in Jerusalem. Thus thinking, he gladly thanked God for his breakfast porridge and the kindliness of good friends who cheered his loneliness. Ginger had spoilt his meditations through arriving growling with the rabbit from the wood, but he consoled himself. It's no good smacking him. It's his nature to hunt, and I cannot break him of it. Peggy and John were full of excitement as they raced along the road to church that morning. They had found their stockings bulging on the bed rail with sweets and fruits, pencils and crayons. A number of parcels left by the postman had not yet been opened. The chicken was already sizzling in the oven, and the pudding walloping about in the witch's pot. And grandest of all, Teddy Tingtong was coming to dinner on his first visit to their home. The church was beautifully decorated with evergreens, and the Bible message was true and direct. The organ pealed out the grand old tune, O come, all ye faithful. But the faithful were very few, judging by the size of the congregation. The church members mostly stayed at home, reading their correspondence, stoking fires, making gravy for the turkey, and sauce for the pudding, to the accompaniment of merry music over the wireless. Teddy had not arrived by the time the children returned, so they kept an eye on the path to the brook. "'Here he comes!' shouted John, as Mother took down the hot plates and Peggy poured out lemonade. The shepherd, dressed in a tidy black suit, was carrying an awkward load under one arm and Ginger under the other. John ran to meet him. "'Happy Christmas, Teddy. Can I help you?' "'No, thank ye, laddie. Ye mustna see you all that's here yet. Yon was a bonny greeting ye sent me.' John flushed with pleasure. "'I'm glad you liked it,' he said. "'We have had a lot.' Leaving his parcels in the porch, Teddy entered the house and set the cat free. "'Welcome to you, Mr. Gray.' smiled Mrs. Broom, hurrying from the kitchen to shake the shepherd's hand. You are our only visitor today, and we are really glad to have you. You've just arrived in the nick of time, said Father, for I'm about to carve the fowl. The children gaily bore Teddy to the table and sat on each side. A pot of golden chrysanthemums and holly stood in the centre, and the firelight from the logs blazing on the hearth danced on the glass and cutlery, so that the whole was a festive sight. When all were served, Mr. Broom gave thanks to God for the meal, not repeating the usual set phrases, but saying a few sincere words of his own composing, for the children's account of the old shepherd and his ways had affected him. How good was the stuffing! How tender the chicken! But in the middle of the enjoyment a terrible thought crossed John's mind, and he put back a fork full of meat on his plate. What is it, dear? asked Mother in a whisper. Are we eating speckle feather? he whispered back. No, dear, of course not. She was buried last week. Daddy got this one from Mr. Wilmot. 
So John resumed the enjoyment of the meal. The pudding glistened darkly with fruit. Peggy had the sixpence and John a silver threepenny bit, save for the occasion. It was a merry meal, and after it was cleared away, Ginger crunched up the pieces with his head sideways on the kitchen floor. "'We're going to light the tree this afternoon and give away the presents,' explained John to Teddy, as they all drew in a ring round the fire. "'Are you enjoying yourself?' "'Eh, my lad, this reminds me of long ago when my own wee John—' The words trailed away into thought as he fastened his eyes on the red fire whose embers seemed to hold pictures of a cosy home long gone. The afternoon sky was growing dark, so that the coloured lights on the tree shone out in beauty. "'I think we should ask our guest to hand round the presents,' suggested Mother. "'Daddy, will you please get them off the tree for Mr Gray?' Teddy wondered if he could manage, but everyone assured him that he could, so he put on his spectacles while Daddy handed him the first parcel. To Mother, from Peggy and John, he read from the label. Whatever can this be? said Mother, removing the paper. You'll love it, said John, who was hopping about in excitement. You need one, so we got it, said Peggy. When it emerged from its final covering, Mother with, was well pleased with what she received, for it was a useful apron, very much like a butcher's, but of various colours. "'My dears!' she exclaimed. "'This is just what I want. Bless your little hearts for thinking of it!' Teddy was already handling the next present. "'To Peggy from Mummy and Daddy.' Peggy's heart beat fast. Was she to get what she wanted most? Perhaps she was too old for one. Still, the parcel looked the right shape. She undid the paper at the fatter end. Yes! It was a beautiful doll with long, real hair in a pink party frock, white socks and black shining shoes. Peggy's cup of joy was full. Running first to mother and then to father, she hugged them and kissed them. All through the dark war years she had gone without a doll, because they were either too scarce or too expensive to be bought. Why, this one is for myself, said Teddy, and was about to lay it down before opening it when John said, Please undo it. Yes, please do, echoed Peggy. What did he find inside but a pair of leather slippers lined with sheep's wool from Mr. and Mrs. Broom? However, can I thank you enough, said the old man. I've never had the like since Mother was alive. Those will keep you warm in your house, said Peggy, who nearly betrayed the fact that there was something else to keep him warm waiting at the foot of the tree. For John from Mummy and Daddy, read out Teddy on the next parcel. John lost no time in discovering the nature of his gift. A wonderful set of carpentry tools, consisting of saw, hammer, gimlet and other requirements. Very little had been forgotten, for Daddy knew just which tools John favoured, those being the same that were most often missing from his workshop. For a daddy from Peggy and John, was the address on the next parcel. Perhaps I have a new shirt, said father, but he was wrong, for his gift consisted of a generous supply of writing paper and envelopes wrapped in a thick wad of pink blotting paper, and his apparent delight with it put an end to Peggy's doubts about the worthiness of it. There were many other gifts, big and small, on the tree. Some could not be opened, but must wait to be delivered in the village, for Mother and the children had thought of poor old Mrs. Dowding, Tommy Sherfield, who was ill, and Mrs. Westcott's children, whose father had been lost at sea. There was even a kipper for Ginger, who was quite ready to start eating it on top of his sumptuous dinner, but his master confiscated it. A dinner can what will be the end of you, Ginger, 
he said, remembering the rabbit. But the cat did not care. He planted himself in front of the fire and purred like a kettle drum. The old shepherd seemed overcome when he discovered that two more gifts awaited him. A stone-hot water bottle from Peggy and a warm blanket with a red border from John. Oh, I'm forgetting myself, he exclaimed, making for the door. I have some wee gifts too. He returned with three clumsy parcels, which seemed anything but small. The long one resolved itself into a fine birch broom for father, and the square ones into a work basket for Peggy and a shopping basket for mother, all products of the forest and the old man's skilful fingers. Everyone marvelled at the gifts. However did you make them? they asked. John was silent, for it seemed that he had been forgotten, and Teddy made no explanation. Presently he slapped his knee. Oh, laddie, I've left yours at home, he said. Oh, yet no, I know, I did pick it up. He felt in his pockets. Ah, yes, here it is, he said, and fetched out a Bible bound in blue with a ribbon hanging from the red-edged pages. Oh, how lovely, cried John, and it's got pictures. The Christmas tree glowed more brightly as the afternoon closed in. The flames leapt around every fresh log placed upon the embers, and sparks flew up the chimney like chains of stars in a black sky. Hearts glowed, too, with love and kindliness, while the wind whipped itself into a gale without, and sometimes bellowed down the wide chimney. That wind makes me think of poor old King Wenceslas plodding along with his boy behind him, observed father. Page and monarch, forth they went, forth they went together, through the rude wind's wild lament and the bitter weather. That gives me an idea, said Mrs. Broom. Let's sing some carols. Yes, do let us, cried the children. Mother found the music and opened the piano, while Peggy and John got each side of her, for they did not know all the words. They sang all the favourites, while shepherds watched their flocks, hark the herald angels sing, and Christians awake, while father chimed in at the parts he knew, and pushed roasting chestnuts about with a poker. Oh, here's Noel, said Peggy, who was turning the pages. Let's sing it all. So they sang it all. And as it was a very long one with six verses, and as many choruses as one can find breath for, they stopped at the end of it for a long rest, though father was inclined to go on singing, Noel, in spite of that. Teddy had not heard all the words before, so he asked for the carol book, adjusted his spectacles, and started to read them. When he reached the last verse, he stopped and said, That's not right. What isn't? asked Mother. Teddy read the verse aloud. Then let us all, with one accord, sing praises to our heavenly Lord, who hath made heaven and earth of naught, and with his blood mankind hath bought. Why not? asked Mother, who would have been shocked had anyone else suggested the fault. Jesus Christ is reckoned to be the creator in that verse, said the shepherd. Well, isn't that so? put in Mr. Broom. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost are one. The Trinity, the three in one, is one of the main doctrines of the Church. But not of the truth, said the old man, who had recently gone into the matter with Kenneth. God the Father was the creator of heaven and earth and all living things, but the human pair that he made sinned and separated themselves and their children from him. God therefore planned to send a son who, by the giving up of his own perfect life, should redeem mankind from death. So in due time God sent his son Jesus, whose birthday we remember today. He was not the creator, 
for the sun did not exist from the beginning, except in the father's mind. Mother was interested. Then you don't believe in the Trinity? she asked. No, indeed, said the shepherd. The scriptures do not support the idea. Then what is the Holy Ghost? asked Mrs. Broom. It is another name for the Holy Spirit, explained Mr. Gray. It is the divine power which comes directly from God to work his will. Where do you get your ideas from? asked Father, sitting in his armchair. Solely from the Bible, answered Teddy. It's hard to understand, but I'm being helped, and if it please God, I shall know the truth one day. What country was Jesus king of? asked John, anxious to take part in the conversation. It says the wise men were seeking a king. Not of any country, dear, said Mother. Jesus ought to be king over our hearts. Excuse me, Mrs. Broom, said Teddy. That's the common idea, but Jesus will be a real king, not over men's hearts only, but over all countries of the earth, with a real throne at his real capital, Jerusalem. Mother looked hard at him. You surprise me, she said. The scriptures will surprise you if you read them properly, said Teddy. Can you prove all your statements? asked Mr. Broom. Yes, I can, replied the old man with conviction. Sometime I'd like you to do so, said Mother. But now, if you'll excuse me, I must see about getting tea. That meal was as merry as the last, though no one felt particularly ready for it. Crackers were the main attraction, and the bright paper hats discovered inside them provided much fun, for Teddy had a bonnet with strings, and Father a pirate's cap. The gale outside made no difference to anyone, save that it caused the semicircle round the fire to draw closer. "'Who was we, John, Teddy?' asked Peggy, suddenly remembering his remark in the afternoon. The shepherd smiled at her and gave a sigh. "'We John was my own laddie, Peggy,' he said, "'but I have not seen him for many a day.' No one asked any more questions, but Teddy himself began his tale. "'The three of us, mother, that is my wife, "'and John and I lived in a cosy cottage in the Braid Hills. "'I was a shepherd to a sheep farmer there.' John was a, a good, obedient lad, and loved his home. But when he grew up, he was not content to be a countryman. He would go to Edinburgh, and there he mixed with folk he should have avoided. Mother and I were not pleased with his manner of life, and he knew it. His visits home became fewer until the time that he asked us for our savings. Whatever we had saved would have been his one day, but he begged us to give him his portion then. Mother, with her generous heart, was all for letting him have it. He did not tell us why he wanted it, but we imagined it might be to help him out of some trouble that had befallen him. We gave in, and he departed. We have never seen him since. We both grieved that our boy did not tell us of his trouble. Teddy stopped, and Mother asked gently, Have you any idea where he went? We heard from him once more. He wrote from an address in London a year afterwards, and that was the last we heard. John might as well be dead. We lived in the cottage till Mother died eleven years ago now. It was terribly lonely without her, but the good Lord comforted me, and I began to read my Bible as never before. I should have stayed on in the wee house, but the one night in the lambing season, when an unforeseen snowstorm blew from the north, I left the fireside to see to the ewes. 
That night my home was burnt out. The neighbours saved just a few things, among them the photograph of mother, and I was glad of that. What made you leave Scotland? asked Mr. Broom. Well, said Teddy, I was sorely puzzled what to do. I had lost everything but health, and that is one of life's greatest blessings. So I decided to come to England as a drover. I worked my way to Lancashire and on to the Midlands, and gradually reached the south. Where did you get your house? asked John. Teddy smiled. At devices, they replied. Finding lodgings was my chief worry, and I didn't like some of the people I was thrown against. So you decided to become independent, asked Mr. Broom. Yes, replied the old man. And though the shilling is rough and poor, I have found great peace in it. For happiness is a matter of the mind, not of circumstance and I am well content. Ginger seems to appreciate comfort, smiled Mother. But Ginger chose to come and live with me. I left the dairy farm for the shilling, didn't you, old chap? The cat rose and waved his tail to acknowledge his master's fond rub. There was silence for a while, then Mrs. Broom spoke. Yours is a sad story, Mr. Gray, she said. But perhaps, like Job's, it will have a happy ending. I'm happy new, protested Teddy, but I have an idea that life may be happier yet. Three hundred and sixty-four days till next Christmas, sighed John later in the evening as he saw the hands of the clock move round to his bedtime. I love Christmas. So do I, said Peggy. Everyone seems to like everybody else a bit more at Christmas time. That's the right spirit, said Teddy. You have given me much cheer and joy today, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Your company has been most enjoyable too, Mother assured him, as he set off home with his presents under one arm and Ginger under the other, preceded by father with a storm lantern and a bag of mince pies. "'Good night, and come again, Teddy,' called the children as the wind-swept figures made their way to the bridge across the brook. That night, as the shepherd lay down in his bunk, with Ginger curled up underneath, he said a little prayer. "'I thank thee, O Lord, for all this kindness of heart. Beside the Brook, Chapter 9, A Duck's Adventures The winter was mild, and though snow fell at the end of January, it soon disappeared, and swelling catkins bobbed on the hazels with their promise of spring. Farmer Wilmot was well pleased with the experiment of keeping sheep and the services of his shepherd, for Teddy proved himself valuable in other ways. He had a way with sick calves and troublesome colts, and could be relied upon when little pigs arrived in the small hours of the morning. Lengthening days brought extra work. There was ploughing and spring sowing, hedging and ditching. The new life of spring gladdened the old man's heart, sending him forth full of hope each morning, and calling him home content at night,
to spend a quiet hour or two before bedtime with his Bible and meditation. The brook swirled by as a brown flood in February, bringing quantities of flotsam that hitched along the banks or got caught in branches fallen across the stream. Here was a board from a hencoop. There had a leaky watering can, floating bulbs and an empty cartridge case. That explained why odd garden flowers sometimes grew by the banks, for the brook washed its way by cottage plots and swept away whatever root or bulb fell in. A clump of narcissus and a black currant bush had thus risen up not far from Teddy's home, and on the bend where the slackening current had cast up a mud bank, there grew a mixture of plants. The close green of celandines clothed it in February, but later in the season it was starred with big primroses, some brown like polyanthus. Higher up the bank where ground ivy trailed thickly among the undergrowth, a bright blue periwinkle opened its eye, the first of a bevy that blossomed for two months, unfurling their coiled petals every morning. Hardly anyone knew about their secret flowering. Beauty unseen by human eye is no loss, for it reflects the beauty of the Creator and gives Him pleasure. Not far away in the same copse grew a rarer periwinkle, purple with a white ring like a pheasant's collar. Peggy discovered this treasure first, and each spring she hunted diligently for the few blooms which she picked and pressed. Now a thicket of blackthorn shone white above the mud bank. So delicate were its blossoms that the drifts of petals and stamens seemed like puffs of silver fog suspended in air. Here a blackbird shuffled over her eggs. Her long brooding must have been a pleasure. There were days, indeed, when silver needles of cold rain lashed her feathers, and a strong wind swayed her nest as if to drive her from her purpose. But her golden eye was constant, now glancing below where purple-spotted orchids flourished tall amid the garlic, now up at the clouds racing across the blue dome beyond the acacia tops. Dozens of other eggs were being hatched in that wood, some were secreted in the cleverest places. Ten tiny white eggs lay along the grey bough of the ash tree in a lichen-covered nest that matched it exactly, lined with feathers picked from its long-tailed tit's own breast. At the bottom of the hole, in the same tree trunk, a clutch of starlings' eggs were not allowed to grow cold. Couched beneath a low arch of honeysuckle, a hen pheasant covered fourteen more. If she sat motionless, she could not be distinguished from the dead oak leaves on which she had laid her olive-brown eggs. But none of these, not even the coot's clever nest pile on an island of sticks in Midbrook, gave more joy to its owner than the hollow containing the beautiful white eggs of a gentle duck. The nest was particularly precious because it was stolen. The brown farmyard duck disdained to lay in her comfortable fox-proof pen. Several days she had poked her flat beak into possible sites, the filled-in burrow beneath the rhododendron bush, the straw heap beside the hayrick and a nettle bed. But at last she decided on a clump of bulrushes above flood level, where she could enjoy the chatter of brook water unseen. Dead rushes made a springy bed for the nest, round which the new growth rose up for a screen. Though quite close to the sheiling, she had no fear of Teddy, from whom she had often received food scraps while paddling in circles near him. So confident was the brown duck in the shepherd's presence that she almost smiled from beneath her beady black eyes when he suddenly came upon her one morning brooding on her nest. Tipping her head sideways, she heaved a vibrant squeak without opening her beak. "'Well, well,' said Teddy, smiling. "'That's your secret, is it?' And later in the day he told Farmer Wilmot. 
Would you like that sitting for yourself, he said. You may have it if you wish. Thank you, sir, said Teddy. I should like it fine. So he watched over the duck, took her out, smashed potato and bacon rind, supplied her with a dish to dabble her food in, and discovered when she waddled off for a taste of brook water that the duckling family might number nine. The fox he heard barking at night worried him, so he found a big box in which he drilled holes and placed that over his trustful charge when evening fell. He did not know how long she had already brooded over the eggs, but hastened to prepare a little pen of wire netting on the grass beside his hut for the family. Twice a day the duck left her eggs to paddle in the brook, in the morning before Teddy went to work and after his return. One quiet evening as the sun was sinking in a pool of gold, the old man was roused by beating of wings and a consternation of quacking. Hastening to the door, he beheld the duck running on tiptoe with outspread wings as fast as her ungainly body would allow towards him. In a moment he saw the cause of the outcry. A precious egg was being borne along by what seemed to be a lithe streak of brown fur. "'Caw, caw!' shrieked the duck. Teddy hurled the first handy object at the robber, but his boot missed the stoat, which nevertheless dropped its burden. The egg was punctured, so he said good-bye to that duckling, and tried to soothe the agitated duck with a slop of bread and water. But she heaved and squeaked inwardly for a long time. Another egg had been rolled from the nest, so that the stoat would probably return. "'I'll borrow a coop,' said the old man, and shut her up for the rest of the time. So for the rest of the brooding period the coop enclosed the nest, and though it shut out the welcome green of the rushes, it gave the duck security, for the shutters were kept closed. Hence it was in darkness that the first egg chipped, and a happy little eep, eep, was answered with a satisfied maternal quack. Teddy discovered the duckling on his return from the fields, its downy head peeping from beneath its mother's wing. "'You pretty little beauty,' he said, but the duckling withdrew below the duck's feathers. The mother refused to leave her hatching after the first arrival, so Teddy put her food inside the coop. Snuggling over her precious family, she looked twice her usual size. Quack, quack, quack. She breathed in low tones and eep, 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 answered her little ones. Only four eggs had hatched, and when after a few days the other four remained below the duck, the shepherd gave them up as failures. So did the mother, who was anxious to descend into the brook with her brood, and a lovely procession they made with mother waddling in front, and the brown and yellow bundles of down waddling one behind the other in perfect imitation. Launching herself, the mother paddled round to witness their plunges. The ducklings waved their funny triangles of feet, dipped their beaks, wagged their tails. Then following the duck into the shallow current, they swam round the bend. Teddy felt great pride in his new family, and transferred them to the pen on their return. Ginger stalked them in their ascent from the brook, but the mother created such a disturbance with wings and beak that he was glad to leave her babies alone. The old man loved to watch them dabble in their dish. Sometimes, perched on the edge, they wavered for a moment and fell in. Oh, what a mess they made of their food! but they throve on it all the same, and issued well fed from the pen every morning and sallied back at night. Soon a little track appeared down to the water's edge. The ducklings grew rapidly, and soon stiff feathers sprouted through the down. Occasionally the mother led them to the farmyard, but her children led them back again, for they preferred the quieter reaches of the brook. Flotillas of other ducks also adventured past the shepherd's hut. Young ones in all stages of growth and in all shades of tawniness, 
but Teddy's family never mixed with them. If near the pen, they waddled up their track out of the way, and if not, they swam under the banks like the coot. By the time the bluebells had disappeared, the duck seemed eager to be gone. The anxiety of motherhood had passed with the growth of her children. Perhaps she remembered the bountiful supply of wheat tipped daily from the farmyard bucket. Anyway, her fa waning affection became so obvious that Teddy took her back to the farmyard one evening after nightfall, leaving the young birds sleeping unaware with their bills tucked into their back feathers. Nevertheless, they missed their mother and waddled about inquiringly with stretched necks in the morning. But the call of the brook made them forget, and they swam along content with each other's company. Ginger treated them with great respect. After all, they were four to one and growing larger every day. He even sat calmly by while they dispatched the food in his saucer and continued to dabble in it after it was empty. The shepherd found them intelligent pets, Black markings leading from the corners of their twinkling black eyes gave them the appearance of smiling. The four were usually gathered round the steps of the hut to greet him on his return from work, expectant of another meal in spite of crops crammed full of tadpoles and tiddlers. "'I'll look for eggs for me before the year's out,' Teddy warned them and the sturdy brood wagged their tails and quacked a confidence assurance that they would do their best. Beside the Brook, Chapter 10, The Pheasant Nursery Mr. Jupe was a very busy man in the spring and summer months, for the woods were peopled with dozens of infant partridges and pheasants, whose lives it was his duty to guard. He used to bribe with a shilling any child who discovered a nest, but how any one had the courage to point one out in a place where one was not supposed to go was a marvel. Perhaps the prospect of the shilling induced the bravery. Anyway, Mr. Jupe took all the eggs into his big pockets and placed them under every broody hen he managed to borrow, because mother pheasants are easily frightened into deserting their nests. Next, the gamekeeper chose a field as pheasant nursery, dotting hen coops about it and moved his own headquarters into a corner of it near the brook. Behind stockades padded with furs or heather, he would sit by the hour waiting for robbers, his ears cocked as well as his gun. A scream in the trees told him of the jay, and from that moment the bird's hours were numbered. A squirrel, scolding and stamping in the trees, betrayed the weasel running snake-like along the bough. A form hovering high in the blue proved itself to be a kestrel hawk, by its sudden dash to earth, and Mr. Jupe's own nose told him when a fox was near. Cats, too, were his target. He would have slain the pet of his own family had he found it in the nursery. The two black retrievers were as keen as their master, waiting by his side for the gun to speak. Away they would race before the smoke of the bank had cleared, returning with a limp thief to lay at his feet. The keeper's vigilance increased with the appearance of the pheasant babies, who were not so sensible as the hen's own chicks. Instead of running to their foster mother for cover from the rushing shadow, 
These babies crouched and froze, relying on their brown and yellow streaks for camouflage. Some escaped thus, but the eye of a practised robber was not easily deceived, so that it behoved Mr. Jupe to come to the rescue. Fur boughs were placed by each coop for shelter and roosting, and regularly the babies were fed with careful mixtures from Mr. Jupe's larder. They ought to thrive, but alas, woe was their lot. Only a few would live to see another spring. Most would find their way to a poultry shop before the holly berries turned red. Up to the brook to the nursery, the four young ducks passed in procession every summer morning. Mr. Duke took no notice of them other than watching out of the corner of his eye to see that they did not touch the pheasant's food in passing, and the ducks took no notice of him other than to acknowledge his presence with a courteous quack quack. Whether the ducks brought ideas back to Ginger or the wind puffed enticing whiffs along the brook towards him is not certain, but the cat took to following them a little further every day. The first day he stopped at a rabbit hole and sniffed a while before coming back. The next day he surprised himself as well as a leveret that jumped from beneath his feet, and the third day he crept into a nursery. The ducks returned that night to their home, but Ginger did not. It was the first time he had failed to be present at tea-time, so that Teddy went round the farmyard, in the wood and to the field beyond, calling, Puss! Puss! Maybe he has followed the children, he thought, and they will bring him back before night. But no one brought Ginger, and Teddy grew uneasy, for one misses even a cat when one lives alone. Frequently during the day his thoughts re-roamed to his lost pet. He remembered to leave food for him. But the ducks finished that before setting out for the day. No Ginger appeared in the evening, but John arrived with a basket of new potatoes and mint. "'Is Ginger spending a holiday with you, laddie?' he asked. "'He hasn't been here since yesterday morning.' "'No, Teddy,' replied John. "'We haven't seen him at all. Wherever can he be?' "'I hope he'll turn up,' said the old man. His voice did not betray uneasiness, but he had a fear that Ginger's hunting instincts had got him into trouble.' "'Peggy and I will look for him,' declared John. "'We must find Ginger.' The children looked everywhere for the cat they loved as much as if he had been their own. They searched the queer places in the timber yard, hung around the dairy, and even went some distance along the high road, but failed to find him. To the woods, however, they did not go for this was the time of the year when Mr. Jupe was most difficult. Mrs. Broom had a shrewd idea about Ginger's fate, for a similar one had befallen two of her cats in early summer. Now she refused to keep one, for Peggy had grieved bitterly over the loss of the second. John had been too young to remember. Teddy, however, forgot Ginger for the time being in dealing with another worry. Returning from work, he could hear the ducks quacking loudly. It was not the ordinary quack of content or impatience, but a distressed quack, 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 followed by a short pause and another outburst. There's something amiss, he said, and when he rounded the drove bend, he saw only three ducks stretching their necks up the steps of the sheiling. Seeing him, they set off towards him, waddling hurriedly in line, quacking the while. "'Now what's happened?' he said to them. And the ducks looked as if all ready to show him, for they turned round and waddled home in front. "'It's Hazel that's missing,' observed Teddy. "'So we must find her.' Only stopping to cast down his load and to quieten the birds with a hasty mash of meal and water, 
the shepherd set off up the brook, the direction that the ducks usually took. With a stick he beat down the nettles and clinging brambles that delayed his progress. He passed both palings that kept back the cattle, and stopped now and again to listen. If Hazel were alive, he would hear her before he saw her. Soon Mr. Jupe's hut appeared in sight, and that gentleman also sitting on a stool with his gun ready nearby, contemplating his family of young pheasants hopping about in their fir boughs. They were now big enough to be seen from a distance, and the keeper with sleeves rolled up and cap pulled down well over his eyes on account of the sun, was smoking a long pipe whose bowl nearly touched the cap. Well pleased with this season's prospect of young birds, he greeted the shepherd genially. "'Evening, shepherd,' he said. "'What brings he along this way?' "'One of my ducks has not come back,' said Teddy. "'Have you seen her?' "'Oh, aye,' replied Mr. Jupe. "'They all went along this morning, as they allus do, "'but I never noticed them coming back. "'Come to think of it, that accounts for row.' "'What row?' asked Teddy. "'Quackin'. "'They ducks have been hollering all our noon up this way and down that way. "'Ark now!' They listened. The sound of quacking could certainly be heard from the farm and the direction of the shilling, but in addition a single cry rose faintly and piteously at intervals from higher up the brook. Mr. Jupe's quick ear decided the matter. "'That be your duck, depend upon it,' he said with finality, "'and I be glad that twant a fox has had her.' Teddy waited no longer, but hurried further up the brook, and as he went Hazel's distressed cry grew louder. A couple of meadows beyond the keeper's hut, the brook flowed through a dark copse, and in the shadows cast by the trees upon the water, he detected a fluttering and beating that seemed to be mixed up with a tangle of sticks in midstream. The quacking stopped a while, for the duck was exhausted with her struggling. Hurriedly the shepherd drew near, and seeing him, Hazel began tugging and crying afresh. A small coil of rusty barbed wire attached to a broken post and caught in a swirl of dead sticks held Hazel fast by the wing and leg. With her free limb she was paddling frantically and beating her wings on the water. The more she strove to get loose, the more tangled she became. A fallen bough happened to be lying near, so Teddy pushed it into the brook and descended to disentangle the victim. Very gently he held her body with his left hand, while with the right he pressed back the cruel barbs that had already torn her flesh and scattered her feathers. It was no easy task, for the wire sometimes sprang back on his own arm, but he took no notice. At last Hazel was free. Teddy climbed to the bank where he examined her. She tried to stand, but flopped. Her wing hung down and her leg was lame. But there was happiness in her eye now that her master had found her. Tucked safely in his jacket with her head poking out, and supported by the curve of his arm, Hazel was borne home along the brookside. Found her then, observed Mr. Jupe as they approached. What's matter? She got caught in some barbed wire in the brook, replied the shepherd. She must have been there some time, judging from the state she's in. But I'll get her right. Give her some hot mash counselled Mr. Jupe, and rub some oil in her feathers. Here, he said in a burst of generosity, or I'll give ye a little maize for her. And from the smelly inside of his larder, he produced a paper bag of grain, which he presented to Teddy with a wink. That's very good of you, Mr. Jupe. Thank you, said the old man. She ought to get better with one thing and another. 
their arrival home was hailed with delight by the other ducks. Gathering round, they watched their master fetch a wooden box and line it with sack and dead grass, while Hazel waited inside the hut on the mat. At intervals they quacked, and so often got in the way that at last Teddy herded them into their pen and shut them up earlier than usual. Hazel enjoyed her hot mash and a little maize, after which she settled comfortably in the box which Teddy placed inside the hut. Then he prepared his belated meal, and his thoughts turned to Ginger. He shook his head. He's been gone for days new. He'll no come back after this. Peggy and John ran to the sheiling just before dark. Has Ginger come back? they asked. No, replied their friend. I'm afraid he's gone for a good. Oh, said Peggy, her face dropping. I won't believe it. But we really have looked everywhere, said John. We're so sorry, Teddy. It's a good thing you have the ducks for company. Then Teddy told them about Hazel, and being invited in to see the invalid, they forgot the cat. "'What will you do with her when you go to work?' asked Peggy. "'I'm sure Mother would look after her.' "'Maybe I'll put her box in the pen,' said Teddy. "'I'll not trouble your mother.' "'Peggy,' said John on the way home, there's one place where we haven't looked for Ginger. His sister did not say, where's that, for she knew. John was only breaking the news that he intended braving Mr. Jupe's anger by going into the big cover. You mean the wood? she asked. All right, John. Tomorrow night after tea. It's too late to go now. Beside the Brook, Chapter 11 Searching for Ginger The children did not look forward to the expedition in search of Ginger. For one thing, it was difficult to get into the big cover without Mr. Jupe seeing them, for his hut and the field of young pheasants lay between it and their house. We'll have to go a long way round, said Peggy. "'Never mind,' replied John. "'It will be worth everything if we find Ginger for Teddy.' So they set off in the other direction from the wood. First they went a distance along the main road, then turned up a lane leading from it towards the back of Big Cover. The lane had high banks with interesting possibilities of birds' nests, but the children would not be tempted from their purpose.' Soon high young oak trees rose on each side from thickets of rhododendron, and then they fell silent, for they felt that their adventure in the woods had begun. The lane crossed a brook by means of a brick bridge that clung about with ivy. "'This is our brook,' said Peggy. "'It looks different,' said John. "'Ah, oh, but we're a good distance from home now,' Peggy reminded him. If I threw something in, I wonder how long it would take to get home, said John. Don't know, replied Peggy. What shall we throw in? She looked about. I've got a good idea, she said, picking a yellow rhododendron leaf from a bush. 
"'What's that?' asked John. Peggy did not reply, for she was busy scratching on the yellow leaf with a pin. "'Dear Teddy, we have gone to look for Ginger, P and J. "'The writing will turn brown presently,' she said, "'and we'll throw it in.' "'Oh, good, Peggy!' cried John. "'Do you think Teddy will get it?' "'He might not,' replied his sister. "'But we'll post it just the same.' They threw in the yellow leaf from the bridge. It struck the current, turned round once, and floated away. For a minute or two they watched it. "'It's caught up,' said John. "'No, it's gone again,' cried Peggy. The yellow leaf bobbed and twirled and at last sailed away round the bend. "'We'd better hurry up,' said Peggy. "'The wood's a big place, and we'll have to be fearfully quiet and careful.' I know, replied her brother, not caring to be reminded of its terrors. If it wasn't for Mr. Jupe, it would be all right. Peggy thought that went without saying, and they proceeded in silence till the lane ended in a grassy cross-track. We'd better go that way, said she, pointing to the right. She was not sure of this part of the big cover, though she knew all the tracks nearest her home. "'Yeah, I suppose that'll be all right,' said John gloomily, glancing at the thick growth on both sides. "'The timber cart's been along here today,' he whispered presently, recognising the friendly and familiar signs. The darkness of the wood had filled him with awe that suggested this manner of conversation. "'We mustn't bother about anything else besides Ginger,' said Peggy reprovingly though secretly she wondered how they were going to conduct the search. "'We had better go to all the open spaces we can find,' she announced after a silence, as if working out a plan. "'Then we can see how far enough for it to be safe to call him.' "'Yes,' agreed John meekly. "'Animals can hear better than human beings,' continued Peggy, hoping fervently that Ginger, if alive, would hear before Mr. Jupe did. The trouble was finding the open spaces. Chestnuts and beeches, rhododendrons, hazels and brambles grew everywhere. The track led them to a meeting of five other tracks that formed a fairly big open space. So the children stopped and Peggy called, Ginger! Ginger! A violent scream broke out from a treetop, and they started with fright. A bird, marked with black and a blue flash on its wing, beat its way through the branches. Pooh, that's only a jay, said John, trying to appear calm. Let's go on, said Peggy. Choosing the centre track, they found themselves on a firmer road, flanked with fir trees and stretches of heather. "'That looks open,' said John, indicating an expanse. Together they crept among the clumps, calling the cat's name. Unseen birds and animals protested against the disturbance. A red squirrel on the way down a fir tree halted, spread-eagled against the trunk, changed his mind and ran up again. But no sound resembling a cat's mew could be heard. "'Whatever's that thing?' asked John, staring at a long neck twisting out from a hole high up in a tree. Uh, yeah, exclaimed Peggy. I don't know, John. And she hurried back to the path, followed closely by her brother. They passed into the trees once more, and presently John caught sight of a queer-looking gateway in a built-up bank. Look, Peggy, he said. That's only a rabbit snare, replied his sister. She had often seen them about the woods. The upright sticks flanked an artificial hole, which tempted unwary rabbits into the trap. "'Perhaps Ginger was caught in one like that,' said John. That tempted them to call his name again. But their voices only roused the deep bark of a dog that seemed not very far away. "'Oh, dear!' cried Peggy, startled. I believe we can't be very far from Mr. Jupe's house. It's somewhere right in the thick part.
part of the wood. John's sharp ears detected the rattle of a chain. Quick, Peggy, he whispered. That's Mr. Jupe's dog got loose. We must run. On flying feet they retraced their steps and at the crossroads darted into the bushes to regain their breath. Do you really think that was a dog's chain? whispered Peggy. Sure of it, her brother replied. Hark! They held their breath. The sound of an approaching bicycle could be heard on the soft grit of the track. Mr. Jupe himself was mounted on it, holding by means of a long chain a big black dog that trotted easily beside him. The girl and boy withdrew closely into the bushes. Would he see them? They hardly breathed as a man and dog passed by. The dog certainly sniffed in a knowing manner as he ran, and the children were very thankful that he was on a chain. A minute or two passed before they relaxed from their fright. Oh, breathed John in relief. He's gone to see the pheasants, said Peggy. So now we know where he is, we might as well go back. This time they hurried. Do you think there are any more dogs at his house, Peggy? asked John. I know he has two, she replied, but they are nearly always tied up. So come on. Not far from the keeper's cottage, which was surrounded by tall trees and thickets of rhododendron, the children entered a little tunnel through the bushes. There were several in that part of the big cover near their home, so they did not hesitate. The tunnel suddenly grew light, and Peggy, who was in front, caught sight of two sheds standing in a small clearing. At first she felt inclined to go back, but when she discovered that no one was about, she went nearer. John, however, did not attempt to follow her. I say, Peggy, don't go. That's Mr. Jupe's place. Don't go, he entreated. But his sister advanced boldly. Walking round the hut, she suddenly stopped. Then she came flying round the corner towards her brother with a look of horror on her face. John, oh, John, she wailed. Rushing past him, she seized his arm, dragging him back along the tunnel. John, we must go home. And then she burst into tears. What's up? asked John. Peggy could not reply, but only rushed madly through the woods, anywhere to get away quickly from what she had seen. Well, what's the matter, Peg? he asked at intervals, when he found breath to speak between racing after his sister. But she could not, or would not, explain. Straight for her home she ran, and instinct seemed to guide her. She did not mind now for Mr. Jupe. In fact, she would have done anything to him if she met him. She would have bitten him. She would have scratched him. She would have... But tears blinded her as she ran with John close behind. A barbed wire fence separated the big cover from Drove, and now Peggy knew where she was. Lying on the ground, she rolled underneath to avoid the barbs, a trick copied faithfully by John. "'What did you see, Peg?' asked John, yet once more hoping to get an answer, now that they were safely out of the wood. "'I found Ginger,' said Peggy. John gasped. "'You found Ginger?' His mouth fell open and stayed like it. Then, when he had recovered from the shock, he said, Then why ever didn't you fetch him home? Peggy, who had stopped running and now was weeping quietly as she walked, sobbed, I couldn't. It was only his skin nailed on a board. John suddenly felt sick. He could find no words to speak. Together they trudged past Pacific Ocean, the weary length of drove. The hunt was over. Perhaps Teddy would cry, too. They found him settling his lame duck for the night, 
and at the sight of his kind face the tired children drew comfort. Gunna Bairns, he said. What terrible thing this happened, that one of you should be crying and the other all ready to begin. The children did not know how to break the dreadful news. The kind old man did not press them to speak, but invited them into the hut and made them sit down. We found Ginger, burst out Peggy at last. Then Teddy understood their grief. He had guessed the cat's fate before this. The search for Hazel showed him just how Ginger had been lured to his death. He asked no questions, but let Peggy go on. I saw his pretty ginger coat, nailed on a board, she lamented. I know it was Ginger's fur, because it had the tabby marks down each side, and his feet were white. Teddy nodded sorrowfully. There was a row of dead things hanging over a wooden fence, the girl continued gruesomely. Weasels and stoats, jays with pretty feathers, and an owl. The shepherd was feeling about in his cupboard for ginger nuts. Never mind, never mind, he was saying. It's maybe your first taste of real sorrow. I'll tell you something in a minute. He fixed up the table, poured out two glasses of milk, and was pleased to notice the children cheer up. It couldn't be helped, he said. We all love Ginger, but we, he couldn't help himself either. At the mention of the cat's name, Peggy's tears welled up again, but she did not sob now as the shepherd continued talking gently. You see, Bairns, Ginger, like all cats, was a natural hunter. His cousins, the tigers of India, the lions of Africa, the jaguars of America, are all the same. It is their nature to hunt and kill. We cannot tame them. Ginger went after the keeper's pheasants, and I dare say killed a few. We can't blame Mr. Duke either. He only did his duty. Peggy's anger surged up at the thought of Mr. Jupe, and she exclaimed, "'He didn't have skin ginger anyway!' "'That's by the way,' went on Teddy. "'But what I want to explain to you is this. "'Killing is the order of the wild places of the earth. "'Animals and birds are either the hunters or the hunted. "'It is no sin for them to kill, because they know no law. "'With people it is different.' God's law tells them what to do. But when God first made living creatures, they did not kill. And there will come a blessed time when they will kill no more. Who said so? asked John. God has said so in his book, replied the shepherd. He reached for his Bible and opening it at the book of Isaiah read aloud. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed, the young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The shepherd continued reading, There shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. That means, said John, when the old man closed the Bible, that cats and weasels and jays won't catch pheasants? Yes, replied the shepherd. Go home now, my dears, and think that over. It will comfort you both. I feel better now, Teddy, said Peggy, rising to go. How is the duck? No so well, I'm afraid. He replied. Her leg is stiff and her wing still droops. But looking after her will help me to forget poor Ginger. As they left the hut, a yellow leaf floated by along the brook. But happily the children did not see it.
Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at btf at cdvideo.org. If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.